Okay, uh, so if you will, turn in your copy of God's journal to 1 Samuel chapter 9, and let's stand for the reading of God's Word. And so we are going to be in 1 Samuel all this morning. And so, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and stand. Somebody was ready to stand. They're like, I don't know where we actually stand. And sure, stand. Let's uh, turn to our uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, and let's stand for the reading of God's Word. And we'll begin reading in verse 1, 1 Samuel chapter 9. In verse 1, we're going to read several verses here to get started. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechorath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you and arise and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim and through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Shalem, and they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them. When they had come to the land of Zoph, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us return. Let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become worried about us. And he said to him, Look now, there is in the city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass, so let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. Then Saul said to his servants, But look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone, and there's no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, this is a parenthetical statement, formerly in Israel when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus or this way. Come, let us go to the seer, for he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Then Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. And as they went up the hill to the city, they met some young women going out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? And they answered and said, Yes, there he is, just ahead of you. Hurry now, for today he came to the city, because there is a sacrifice of the people today on the high place. As soon as you come into the city, you will surely find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now therefore go up, for about this time you will find him. So they went up to the city, and as they were coming into the city... There was Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Father, we thank you for your word. And as we look at the life of Saul this morning, I pray that we would glean truth. I pray that we would be inspired. Father, I pray that we would be warned. I pray that we'd be educated and informed on how we could and should serve you. I pray that today that we would have a mindset to be equipped and passionate about our obedience and service to you, our God and King. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. (laughs) Here we find the beginning of the record of Saul. This was King Saul, or soon to be king, from where we're at reading. Now, Saul is not the same one that you hear about or read about when you read in the New Testament. You should differentiate between the two as there's about a thousand years between the two of them. So, Saul or Paul the Apostle, uh, those that would say, well, his name was changed to Paul, that's not actually uh, accurate. His name was always Saul and was always Paul. Paul is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Saul. 
And so Paul just began to use, or Saul began to use his Greek name Paul as he went to the Gentiles to preach the gospel. But he was uh, Saul and Paul. Now, that is not the King Saul that we're talking about. So rewinding the tape a thousand years to the time of the kings. See, up till King Saul, there were no kings in Israel. Samuel, this seer, a.k.a. prophet, was a judge in Israel. And Israel had been overseen by judges for a while, since the time of uh, Moses and Joshua. And so these were people that God put in place to lead His people. But at some point, the people of Israel said, we want a king like the other nations have a king. And this hurt Samuel. He said, you know, what's the deal? You know, am I not doing a good job? And God said to Samuel, hey, it's not about you. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. But we're going to give them a king and they're going to learn what it's like to live under a king. They're going to have good kings and they're going to have bad kings. And that's the way it's going to be until they have the king of kings, the good king. And so we consider this man Saul. He was a handsome man. He was a tall man. And as a, a Hebrew or Israelite, he was probably a dark man. So he was literally tall, dark, and handsome. So that's everything the women say they want in a man. And he was a strong man, and he was a courageous man. And here we find him coming in contact with this prophet. Now the prophet was a man who was ordained by God to do many things, up to and including this blessing of these sacrifices, and a go-between, a representative. See, this king was not the, the, the representative necessarily for God on earth. God, in, in his kings, as he set up this first king Saul and the kings that would follow, they would often have a prophet alongside them, or maybe sometimes more than one, that would speak to them concerning the things of God. And God was not doing away with that. And so Samuel had this role. It was a very important role. And Samuel was one to step up to and fulfill his obligations to God. So, as we read, Samuel was in town to bless the sacrifice, and the people wouldn't eat. They knew that Samuel was there on behalf of God to do his bidding. And here he comes in contact with this young man named Saul. And we know that God, we're going to fast forward a little bit, God uh, ordains Saul, gives him great favor, and Saul ends up being picked out of everybody else to be the first king of Israel. And so because of God's favor... Saul becomes king. But we're going to skip forward a little bit to 1 Samuel chapter 13. It shouldn't take you long if you're already there in 1 Samuel. Just turn a few pages to Samuel chapter 13. We'll begin to read in verse 1. Saul now reigned one year. So here is King Saul now. And when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in the mountains of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan, his son, in Gabeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent away, every man to his tent. And Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines. The Philistines are the uh, arch nemesis of the Israelites. And so he, it says that Saul, they attacked... Where did I play? Lose my play. And Jonathan attacked, Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard it and said that Saul had attacked the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines, and the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. Then the Philistines gathered to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So we find here that, that Saul, 
And the enemies, the children of Israel, and the enemies of the children of Israel, the Philistines, have kind of surrounded them, and there's a whole bunch of them. And so you can imagine as King you know, Saul would be like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? We've got the enemies all around us, and they're in great number. I've got to do something, and, and you know, for fear maybe, the, you know, the enemy's going to overtake us. But there had evidently an arrangement been made where Samuel was going to come, and so we pick up that where it says that in verse 8, Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, verse 9, Bring a burnt offering and a peace offering here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And so, you know, Saul was supposed to wait for Samuel. And sure enough, when he says, I can't wait anymore, uh, you, know, you, might, you might say, well, Samuel shouldn't have been late. Now, this was a test for Saul to see if he was going to wait. If he was going to let Samuel do what God ordained Samuel to do, Saul do the things that God ordained Saul to do. Oftentimes, we're overstepping our boundaries. And we don't know our place. God has called you to do a particular thing in His kingdom, even in the church. And you get overly concerned with what somebody else is supposed to do. And you get out of place, out of line. And I believe that sometimes we upset God because we don't focus on the things that He's given us to do. Saul steps outside of line and he does something that Samuel is ordained to do. And as soon as he's tired of waiting and he does the sacrifice himself, here comes the official person that was supposed to do the sacrifice, and that's Samuel in verse 11. And Samuel says, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered for me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. So here Saul, he said, what it is, he's starting to feel the pressure. And so he knows what he's supposed to do, and he knows what he's not supposed to do. But because time is passing and he begins to feel pressured, he says, I was compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be the commander over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. If you are taking notes, if we had a bulletin to hand out, our first outline would be, Be strong and don't give in to pressure. Be strong and don't give in to pressure. We are being pressured on every side today. We're being pressured to accept people's positions concerning the pandemic, the politics, and prejudice, all the things that are falling down on us at one time in our country right now, people are feeling pressure. Especially as now time has surely passed when we should be past some of these things. We should be past the pandemic, I'm sure a lot of us feel that way. We should be past some of this, this, this conflict and some of this political stuff we know is always going to be happening, but it's intensified and it's, it's more than it would normally be. And then you have all of the, the, uh, the uh, social issues and pressure and conflict. I mean, it's just a boiling point in our country. Things are bad. They just really aren't. I'm not being uh, you know, one to try to you know, paint a gloomy picture. Man, the, the picture's been painted. I'm just an observer now and say, man, it's a bad place in the world today. I praise God that I am a member and subject loyal to my king in the kingdom of God that reigns forever under a just king who will never be thrown out, overthrown, uh, elected out, voted out. He is the king of kings, the ruler, and he is my king. And I know that I'm set in my social place that is the spiritual social place that is the kingdom of God. But I have great concern 
Not only for my fellow believers that they would be prepared as the Lord I know is challenging us all, me, to be prepared for the society that is growing darker and more wicked and evil and violence and conflict is just compounding every day. How are you going to act? Because I believe a lot of people are we're going to find out really who they are. I see a lot of people who, who claim to be you know, close to Christ, claim to be a follower of Christ, and in the midst of all this that's going on, I see their lashing out, and I see their flesh being pushed out and fleshed out. And I say, you know what? We have got to be strong and don't give in to the pressure of societies and those around us. Sometimes we just need to sit back and let the ugliness do what it's going to do and you step back and be free from it and maintain obedience as Saul should have done, but he disobeyed God as things were closing in on him. If we were to be honest, we could see around us things closing in on us, but God is still going to be on time if we will hold out and be strong. We're going to continue to follow the life of Saul as we jump forward to chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15 will begin also in verse 1. Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but, be, but kill both man and women, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep and camel and donkey. I'm going to stop right there. That's, a, that's a, a, a tough saying right there. First off, when it says that Amalek, he, Amalek, and he, Israel, he's talking about the descendants of a man named Amalek and the descendants of a man named Israel. As both of the men proper had been dead for some time, their descendants, the Amalekites, and the descendants of Israel, the Israelites. As the Israelites were coming out of Egypt... And, and those that were in the back and the rear, the Amalekites would come and attack them. And, and they did ungodly and e evil in their, in their uh, uh, lack of mercy and cruelty to the Israelites. And God had made a promise to Moses. Hundreds of years before this, God made a pro promise to Moses. He says, I am going to utterly destroy this nation from the face of the earth. I will utterly destroy them for what they have done to you. And so again... After hundreds of years, you'd think God had forgot His promises, but God's timing is not like our timing. He sees things from the eternal perspective. And I want you to keep that in mind, even as you consider that God's going to wipe out a completely, wipe out a whole nation. Now, we get caught up in how old someone is when they die on this earth. But all of it, according to Scripture, is a flash in the pan, a vapor that appears for a little time. And so all of it is super quick and too soon, if you will from God's perspective, but he's always looking at the eternal perspective. And so it's quite possible that the Amalekites were completely, utterly wicked and evil, and if God wants to destroy them, that's up to him. It also could be said that if God wants to destroy the nation and all those that were maybe young and did not have uh, uh, evil in their heart, they, you know, they go into the presence of God, that's God's business. Let him do what he wants to do. God's still God regardless. But here's the thing. Saul has this amazing opportunity to be the guy who is going to fulfill a promise God made to the children of Israel, you know, a hundred years or hundreds of years before that. He's like, wow, what a, great, what, a, what a great honor. You know, what an honor it is to be the one that's going to fulfill, be the one used by God to fulfill this promise, especially after you've done messed up. You know, with this sacrificing and getting out of line, now God's given you a chance to do something uh, that he promised the children of Israel. It says in verse 4, So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they come up, came up out of Egypt. 
He says, hey, there's some other people over here that had shown kindness. You better get away because of the, the wrath of God fixing to come down on these Amalekites. You don't want to be around them. But you were kind to us, so we're going to show mercy on you. Get out of here. And Saul attacked the Amalekites, verse 7, from Havilah, Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, the king, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatling, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. So God said, come in and completely annihilate everything. And they said, you know what, let's just annihilate everything that we don't see value in, and we'll keep the other stuff alive. You know, the king, you know, and, 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 and what did he have plans to do with this king and, and, and the best of the sheep and oxen, you know, all this. But that's not what God had said. And in verse 10, now the word of the Lord came to Samuel. Here's the prophet, the seer. The word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. You know, last week we talked about Noah and how God said, It grieves me. Man is grieving me. It grieved me that I created them. Now I just, it grieves me in my heart that Saul, who I made king, it grieves me and I, that, that, that I've made him king. And of course, Samuel also is grieving and he cried out to the Lord all night. Verse 12. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel saying, Saul went to Carmel. And indeed, he has set up a monument for himself, and he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Did you? <laughs> no, he did not. And yet he's confessing as he sees the prophet coming. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears? I hear back. That's my bleeding, okay? By, he said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? He says, if you destroyed everybody and everything like God told you to do, you just said you were obedient to the commandment, why am I hearing evidence to the contrary? And Saul said, they, <laughs> they quickly changed to they, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. He starts playing the blame game right here. He said, they did it, the people. And they shared the, spared the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. He said, they and you. See how he's trying to separate himself from accountability? How he's trying to squirm out of it right there? They and you. And it says, the people have spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. When it comes to utterly destroyed, now it's we. You see that? Isn't that, isn't that amazing how he is trying to distance himself from accountability right there? And then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. And I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission. And what a beautiful opportunity he had. He was on a great mission from God. Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on the which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. How can you utterly destroy the Amalekites when you've got the king of the Amalekites right before you? But the people took of the plunder, Saul continues, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Samuel said, Has the Lord... As great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Here's something that everybody needs to have underlined in their heart. Obedience is, is better, greater than sacrifice. 
So here Saul's like, I'm not going to do what I'm told, but I'm going to do something good as a, 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 in, in, in its opposition and its place. I'm gonna do, not going to do what God called me to do, but I'm going to do something good. It's like living a life of disobedience and not walking with God on a daily basis, but coming in and giving your tithe and your offering. I mean, is that really how this works? No, God has called us to a life of obedience, and He's more concerned about obedience than our sacrifices. If you're going to make a sacrifice to the Lord, let that sacrifice be a sacrifice of obedience, saying, I'm going to be obedient to you and not serve my own And so Samuel continues in verse 23, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Meaning you don't do what you're supposed to do. When you rebel against God, and you rebel against the authorities that God put in place. Rebellion as is is the sin of witchcraft. Now of course, Peter said we ought to obey God rather than men. And so whenever the government tells you to do something and it goes against what God tells you to do, obviously you obey God. But there are a lot of people that are disobeying laws just because they're rebels. They're just rebellious. They're just disobedient in their heart. And they've outgrown their parents' homes so they they feel like that they're not disobedient, but they're still disobedient little children because they are rebellion. They have rebellion in their hearts. This is what it says. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, Samuel says, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, He has also rejected you from being king. Here it is again. Samuel said it in the last place that we read. God has rejected you. I'm going to tell you something. God has called a lot of us to do great things. And just like it said, Samuel said in the last passage, he said, had you obeyed, God would have set up your kingdom forever. What that means is your children would have been king, and your son would have been king, and his son would have been king. Your kingdom would have been set up forever. He said, because you disobeyed, the kingdom will be taken from you. But it was in Saul's power to walk in the promise that God made him. But because of his disobedience, God is free from that covenant and will retract and take away. And how many things have been taken away from me? I can only imagine. But because of his great mercy and his grace and my repentance, he will give me new covenants and new opportunities. But how many times have we missed? I don't want to miss any more of the promises of God. And I'm not talking about for earthly gain, but just because of spiritual gain and my closeness and my calling, I don't want to miss. Then then Saul said to Samuel in verse 24, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So, as we read earlier in our outline Be strong and don't give in to pressure. Number two in our outline, be strong and don't give in to fear. Don't give in to fear because surely, just like pressure, there's fear on every side today concerning the pandemic and and the political landscape and the future of this country and and the racial prejudice and all that's going on as there's so much conflict. It's easy to give in to fear and step out of obedience. God has called us to not walk in fear. And if we begin to be consumed by fear, we are now walking in disobedience. We need to obey and trust God and do not fear, lest that fear cause us to act out in a way that is disobedient to God and that's exactly exactly what happened to Saul. He began to feel the pressure. He began to feel fear. It says in verse 25, Now therefore please pardon my sin, Samuel, or Saul says, and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. The favor that God had on Saul has now been taken away, and I dare say to you right now that there's been favor that God put in your life that he is now taking away because of your disobedience. You've rejected the word of the Lord, and because of your rebellious and disobedience, obedient heart the favor of God is being taken away and you unfortunately may never put the two together when you see your life falling apart and don't realize it's because of your disobedience I say to you today put the two together connect the dots today lest you continue 
in your loss of God's favor and continue in disobedience. Skipping forward to chapter 18, we'll continue in this life of Samuel. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So here we find this man, David. And so after these instances we've just read about, we know that the Israelites continue to to be at war with the Philistines, and it's there one of the Philistine uh, leaders is this giant named Goliath, and a young shepherd boy comes in and slays him and eventually finds favor with the king's son and with the king. And we find here that David and the son of, of Saul, Jonathan, are close together. And Jonathan loved David as his own soul. Verse 2, Saul took him that day and would not let him go to his father's house anymore. He didn't let David go. He says, David, you're staying here with us because you're awesome. We love you. And this is great, right? That's the way it starts out. Because he had defeated the giant. It says, then Jonathan and David made a covenant, verse 3, because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even to his sword and and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul sent him over the, set, set him over the men of war. And he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So now David is finding favor with God, favor with Saul, and with favor with all the people. In verse 6, Now it happened as they were coming home when David was returning to the, from the slaughter of the Philistines. So now they're winning because of David that the women came out of the city of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines as any king would be met when he comes back from war as a victor. And he comes back and they're singing and dancing with tambourines with joy with musical instruments. Verse 7, So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. I tell you right now, as there's only a few women in here and I can escape out the back door without getting attacked, watch them women, they will cause some trouble. <laughs> there's these women here and you, you can only imagine that surely they knew when you tell the sing a song in front of the king oh look he's he's uh, uh, you know he's conquered his thousands but david his ten thousands uh, regardless of the intent of the heart of these women <clears throat> it was very effective and impactful in turning Saul's heart it says in verse 8 then Saul was very angry And the saying displeased him, and he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousand. To me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. From that day forward, Saul began to be consumed with hatred for David. And we see that he he ends up pursuing David and and trying to kill David. And he he does that above all other things. This becomes his number one thing. He became consumed. You can see this progressive and, and this destructive and erosion of the promises of God in Saul's life and all the favor as he begins to give in. Even now, he begins to give in to hate. If you were to look in your outline, if we had one, it would say, be strong and don't give in to hate. It's a progressive thing when we walk in disobedience. We will begin to become hateful. And surely we are being tempted to give in to hate on every side. Pressure to accept people's position on the pandemic, politics, and prejudice. And I'm seeing that people are being stirred up in their hearts and hatred is increasing in our society, and hatred is coming forward out of people's heart as they continue to walk in disobedience from God. I want to give you a heads up right now. Stop. Stop disobeying God. Get right with God now. Get your heart right before Him. Walk in obedience before Him. Don't give in to pressure. Don't give in to pressure and don't give in to fear and don't give in to hate because they're all coming after you right now. I guarantee it in our society. All of them are coming after you. Pressure, fear, and hatred. All of those are coming in to try to get you to buy in to them. The pressure, the fear, and the hatred. 
I want us to conclude with Saul's tragic end. And it is tragic and it's sad. But it's a warning to us all. In 1 Samuel chapter 31, if you would turn there quickly, we'll close with these six verses. Now the Philistines, in verse 1, fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons. And the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's sons, all three of them. Then the battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. Quite the opposite of what God wanted for Saul. And Saul had every opportunity as Samuel declared to him that had you obeyed God, he would have established your kingdom forever and your descendants on that, on that throne. But because of his disobedience, him and his sons died there on this battlefield. Three of his sons that day. See, Saul was not strong. Quite the opposite of our outline today. Saul was not strong and he gave in. To pressure, fear, and hate. I want to close this morning with a clear challenge to you. Amidst all that's happening in our society today, don't give in to the pressure. Don't give in to fear. And don't give in to hate. For they're all coming to claim you. Don't give in. Stand strong. Be obedient. Father, we thank You for Your Word. And as we stand here now, I pray that we would stand firm and that we would not give in. I pray that we would not surrender to any of the pressures around us that would cause us to compromise the life that You've called us to. We would not fear those that would try to pressure us and bring harm to us. And I pray that we would not give in to all the hate as we see wickedness and we see an injustice all around us, I pray that we would not give in to hate. But that we, on the other hand, would be a people who are long-suffering. Therefore, do not give in to pressure. We're a people of faith. Therefore, we will not give in to fear. And we are a people of love. And will never surrender to hate. In Jesus' name, amen.